All right, so welcome to another episode of BZ Listening. I am your host, BZ Douglas. I'm an independent journalist based in Cleveland, Ohio. And my guest today is Daniel of uh, the YouTube channel Anarch. And um, I discovered his content, I think, through the algorithm. But I also am pretty sure uh, when I, I'm a big uh, fan of like YouTube essays on a lot of subjects, uh, probably came into it through like the media criticism world, like deep, deep dive video essays on um, TV shows or things like that. But I stuck around for a lot of the great political uh, content that's out there and, and deep dives into history and philosophy. And I came across this video from Anarch called A Modern Anarchism. And it just perfectly distilled everything that I had aspirations to one day articulate or produce in a video that synthesized um, the history of anarchist thinking and, and starting to conceptualize um, my understanding of how it can be applied in a modern context. The layman's understanding of anarchism is that it represents the rejection of all rules and organization, leading many to envision chaos or power vacuum to be quickly filled with a new tyrant or a wilderness fought over by atomized humans. But behind these spectacles of destruction and revolt, which the reigning power structures have distributed in deceptively cut video clips and convenient political narratives, there is an entire body of theory and revolutionary history that is hidden. And within this body of theory, there have been a number of different ways of defining anarchism, each with its own merit. Before I give my definition, I'd like to inspect a few passages from notable thinkers in the field so that we can see what facets reoccur within the discussion. In the introduction to anarcho-syndicalism, theory and practice, for example, Rudolf Rocker says that, Anarchism is a definite intellectual current in the life of our times, whose adherents advocate the abolition of economic monopolies and of all political and social coercive institutions within society. Enrico Malatesta states his definition of anarchism quite clearly in a response he wrote to Kropotkin's Science and Anarchy, saying that, Anarchism is the method of reaching anarchy through freedom, without those authoritarian institutions that impose their will on others by force, even if it happens to be in a good cause. It is also commonly said by thinkers such as Peter Kropotkin or Lorenzo Camboa Irvin that anarchism is the no-government system of socialism. Many other variations can be found throughout the literature. But what we will explore in the following series of essays is how each of these actually describe different aspects of a cohesive theoretical whole. After all, there are many aspects to the body of anarchism that one might wish to include in their definition. In both Rocker and Malatesta's versions, for example, we see a shared understanding of anarchism as being the method through which a new form of society is reached. In Rocker's, additionally, we get an understanding of anarchism as a body of political theory, an intellectual current, as he says. And lastly, in Irvin and Kropotkin's, we get a description of its orientation within the body of socialist theory as an anti-state philosophy. Here, I will offer the following definition. Anarchism is the opposition to all hierarchical power structures, the framework for locating and understanding them, and the method by which we might dismantle and replace those hierarchical power structures with a horizontal society of free association, controlled together by the people, which we call anarchy. This to me, this interview was a great opportunity to um, sort of do an official coming out and laying out of the fact that I am an anarchist as a journalist, which coming into that space, it it dawns on you very quickly um, that it's that's a diversity we don't see in media. You know, you might see black people, you know, uh, you know, women more representative. It's not just white men on the screen and on the ground, but 
they're all from liberal, Republican, all agree that the status quo is pretty pretty on track. So um, uh, this feels, like I said, like an opportunity to come out as an anarchist. And uh, I wanted to share with you like my path to becoming an anarchist. But before I do that, because I've talked quite a bit in this intro, uh, I wanted to know what has been your path to anarchy? Yeah, yeah, I... I get this question somewhat often, and uh, I feel like I've given a, a, a bunch of different variations of answers to this. Um, I suppose I first started calling myself anarchist during the Occupy movement. Uh, my first, my first like uh, uh, encounter with organizing was uh, with Occupy Tulsa, and. I started studying some of the more typical kind of gateways to anarchism like Chomsky and Howard Zinn and stuff and uh, began calling myself anarcho-syndicalist after I started to study all of that. But, um, you know, that's that's sort of a, a, a rigid answer. I, I suppose the broader answer is just that I've always had a sort of skepticism of authority structures, right? Hierarchical power has over the course of my life, at least, uh, constantly failed to meet the demands that are set upon it. And uh, I, I feel as if that was constantly inculcating within me this sort of anarchist spirit, this sort of rejection of all hierarchical power structures little by little. Um, I don't feel as if I was really a, a, a very committed anarchist until maybe only, however, like the last few years. And I feel like what was important for that was well, I mean, there's a f quite a few things that go into any big transformation, but the two main things were watching electoralism fail and number two, reading a lot of anarchist theory. <laughs> so, um, just to, um, one thing is so like Occupy is where you, you were introduced to anarchism and you and I have that in common. Um, but um, Prior to that, like, what's your arc of alignment? Were you apolitical? Were you on another track, sort of inheriting political views from your parents or rejecting the ones you were raised with? You know, in my household, things were generally pretty apolitical, uh, but they were pro labor. My dad was in a union, my dad worked as a UPS driver for decades. Um, and uh, even though my mom and dad were like Southern Baptist here in Oklahoma, which, you know, is a pretty conservative uh, Christian denomination overall, um, they had pretty pro labor politics in a general sense. So you might say they were kind of like very pro labor Democrats, you know, they they had a sort of liberal perspective on most things, even if their perspective was kind of conservative. Um, I would say I was just kind of a liberal for a very long time. Uh, I think then as I was moving through Occupy, I was going through a conversion from sort of a standard liberal view on the world into sort of social, like radical social Democrat perspective, right? That was kind of what I think a lot of people went through during Occupy, in fact. It was like the exit from liberalism into social democratic viewpoints. And then a lot of people were playing with like anarchism and various kinds of libertarian socialist perspectives while they were taking that journey. Um, but yeah, so for, you know, I would say I was a liberal when I was young, kind of did a thing where I was like social democrat, but with leanings towards anarcho-syndicalist analysis. And maybe in the last few years, I would say that I'm like a consistent, committed anarchist. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I had a similar thing where, um, we, I grew up, uh, my dad was in the air force and, um, through just like various circumstances, he ended up being like an audio technician working for Reagan, like in DC. And that's where I I grew up, but we were completely apolitical. I remember it was at some point that I asked, Hey, are we, I keep hearing Democrat or Republican on like the news. What are we one of those? And I was told, well, we're Republican because, um, they want less taxes. So we, we don't want to pay as much taxes, no discussion about what taxes were it, but, and then no, that wasn't heavy handed. It was just sort of like, I don't know, I guess we're that when we show up to vote and not in committal to it. So, I wasn't indoctrinated, and if anything, I was kind of apolitical, just swept along. I remember the Gulf War happened when I was, you know, that I forget what, you know, I would have been like uh, just about going into high school, 
And it was just like, oh, that's a thing that's happening. You know, it's on the news. There was no discussion about war or what it might be or, or who, you know, how, why it was being conducted other than just like, well, we watch the news and what they say is pretty much what's going on. And so that's how I was just floating through, not really thinking like, oh, politics, like whatever. That's a thing some people are interested in. I knew people who were into Nader during Bush versus Gore. And I just assumed Bush, uh, W. Bush couldn't win because he was the other guy's son. I was like, that's corny. Like, that's too tacky. That wouldn't happen. But uh, and but people I knew who were like, really like, I, he better not win. I was like, well, OK, I, I guess. And then 9-11 happened. And I was about, you know, 20, 23 or so. And um, uh, it, it just, I was just home alone. And I remember going outside and standing out and looking at a quiet neighborhood and like, and then just turning around and going back in and watching the news and being like, oh my God, I don't know what's going on. And that is when, um, you know, I discovered like Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn and, and Gore Vidal and, and I started to realize, well, I'm in, I'm not Bush. And I, um, so I'm, a, I, I'm team Democrat. And if the first election that I was paying attention to, then it was Dennis Kucinich and, um, Howard, then Howard Dean became like the dark horse candidate. And I went all in on trying to support him from where I lived and, and canvassing and stuff like that. And, um, that was my first taste of seeing like the media just like, assassinating his candidacy with a, with a, a media moment that they were able to just make viral because they decided what was viral. It wasn't an organic thing that popular that happened. Um, but anyway, so my heart got broken there and over, over time. Yeah, I was just, um, then when Obama came around, I was, I was kind of for him for the same reason I was anti, you know, like, or I, I, I was against Clinton on a certain level of the dynastic quality of it. Like the monarch, like of going like Bush, Clinton, Clinton, Bush, Bush, and then back to Clinton. I was like, no. But on top of that, seeing like her foreign policy as a senator, I was like, I'd rather take a shot with Obama, but very wary. And so my swing from liberal Democrat to like I something more, I need something more than this was seeing that. Um, the, I started to become aware of authority under Bush and authoritarian thinking and, and reading the psychology of it and seeing how it manifested uh, with, with Republicans. Um, and then Obama was elected and people who were voicing like the same criticisms that were consistent about like foreign policy under uh, uh, Bush were chastised and diminished by, you know, liberals who were now their authoritarian thinking kicked in. It's like, no, this is our guy. We got to trust him. Um, and that's when I started to realize like, okay, the party thing is damaged because this, this authoritarian thing is a thing. And I, I didn't have a word for it. And then Occupy happened while I was living in New York. And I was also at the time, ironically, as much as I was like, this is amazing. This needs, I'm so glad people are coming together about this stuff. Uh, I was working in like corporate advertising in a, a career I just fell into be out of like a working like, oh, I got a job doing HTML. Cool. I can um, I'll follow this where it goes. And that led up to like the ladder of just working at bigger agencies. Eventually, like, you know, I was working on Citibank exclusively uh, making banner ads for them and all kinds of just annoying shit for their, their, uh, you know, the agency. And, and then I was going down to Occupy on my lunch breaks to attend workshops and listen to people. And, um, I ended up proposing to my wife down there because the people's mic just struck me as this beautiful thing. And I wanted to, you know, you know, go down there and just be like, you know, make that part of our story that we were got to be there. And I threw myself so much into it. And I fell in love with, as far as anarchy, the aspiration of it and these mechanisms for, and ultimately, like the first real big thing that allured me was um, the striving for consensus instead of, well, we won, so our idea goes, as opposed to, okay, where where's the disparity? And Occupy was a messy place to be introduced to anarchy too, because there were all kinds, it was you know, especially in New York at the heart of it. 
And, you know, there's all kind of disruptors that were in good faith and bad and police interference and the sort of thing that makes like anarchy seem like this scary, dangerous thing. But it, it always stuck with me and kind of like you too, to just button up, like, this is my path to now I'm like, Hey, I'm an anarchist was really seeing how is uh, once again being attacked and um, misrepresented, like holding up these types of people and activities and saying, that's anarchy, that's anarchists, these Antifa, whatever, or um, using the word as like a dangerous epithet during the Trump years. And I was like, hi, I'm an anarchist. <laughs> and I really am also like, you know, this gets into maybe like how I, you know, wanted to talk about how I live as an anarchist and, and, and you have a, a lot to talk about that. And one way is, is really that I think is um, I think an important micro point of praxis is wearing it on your sleeve. If you, if you understand it, you've come to it. And I have like a shorthand for it with people of different types and um, you know, just really saying like, look, it's not really about the, the economic axis of left and right. It's about the top and bottom axis, the up and down of power and authority and, and how it's derived and, and, and the mechanisms through which we achieve it and constantly questioning those. And part of that axis is curiosity over certainty. And, and, and so, yeah, that's and, and, and wearing that on my sleeve as a journalist with all kinds of, you know, spanning from like, you know, I have people who are apolitical, who are Democrats, who are Republicans, who are communists. Um, but, you know, just saying this is where I'm coming from, you know, I'm not in the tank with either party, but also, you know, my philosophical devotion is to the central notion of authority, how it's exercised. And it's really the ideal mental alignment for a journalist I found. <laughs> I definitely think it it is. Um, in fact, I think it's an ideal uh, mental alignment for a bunch of careers that don't even recognize it, um, including scientists and academics more generally, and artists and things like that. Um, I think that if if they only thought about it for a little while and researched it a little more thoroughly, they would find that it is extremely well aligned to the fundamental values of those those um, you know professions. Um, yeah, but but uh, you know, I identify with this sort of process of of trying to think within the system for an extended period of time. Um, not only being stuck in it through just kind of the natural process of of living life, but also like even giving it a little while to demonstrate itself, right? Like like giving it a chance even, right? Where where you're like, okay, system, uh, seems like you got a lot of things figured out. Surely I can like, you know, this process of Republicans and Democrats constantly fencing with one another um, can lead to, to some sort of substantial improvement. Um, history seems to suggest there's something there. And then all just sort of like experiencing the dead end of this process um, and at the same time, also seeing uh, Occupy rise. So very, very interesting parallels in, in how we went through this process. I think one thing is, is you're a little older than I am. So, you know, the Gulf War, I would have been very, very young if I was even uh, conscious at all. Uh, my earliest political memory would have been like the Iraq War, right? Um, so 9-11, obviously, but, you know, I didn't really have like a, a political perspective per se until the Iraq War started demonstrating started to demonstrate itself as just an utter failure of foreign policy and, and or I guess more appropriately, a, a success of the foreign policy of an authoritarian empire. But, you know, the failure of this foreign policy to, to really get the its own people anything or to improve the lives of the planet, the lives of the people on the planet. And so kind of like as I saw this all fall apart, it was it was taking place at the same time as I was radicalizing, probably very directly linked course to me radicalizing. Um, yeah, well, Occupy Wall Street, uh, the, the, another notable difference is probably that Occupy Wall Street was massive and was the epicenter of all of this. Um, uh, Occupy Tulsa was pretty significant. Um, you know, we had a substantial number of people out there. The movement made the news several times. The protests were quite large. There was a lot of coordination with, with regional groups, but um, we also had problems with splitting, also had problems, as you say, with uh, 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 actors that were causing damage, both 
people in good faith and bad faith, you know, both of them being involved and having to work our way through that precisely um, uh, in the way that you're speaking about the importance of consensus, but also how it's all tied up in that process of figuring out how to navigate these these choppy waters that that arise as all kinds of people get mixed up in your movement. And, and uh, to a degree, you might say I've been spending the last 11 years trying to, to figure out good organizational answers to questions like that. And uh, uh, to some significant degree, the occasions of what took place in Occupy uh, ended up informing my entire uh, praxis for the, for the many years to, to come, uh, not, not just in so far as I was stuck within it, but that I had to learn from it, looking back upon it as an example to, to, um, you know, compare the things I was doing to, uh, to it and, and understanding things by comparison and contrast to it. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think we have a lot of similarities in, in how that whole journey went. And, um, what I found really, uh, excellent about your video essays and then taking in um, some of the recent interviews you've done with, with other channels uh, in preparation for this is um, some, some key points you, you hit a lot now that are like, I guess you're talking points. And one of them that is really great that I, I certainly want to adopt because it gets to, I think um, to what, whatever degree, you know, my, my praxis, how I live as an anarchist is, and that is, um, the means or the end that the, the, the union of those two. And, um, so anarchy to me, you know, there initially I thought like, well, I can't adopt that label because I'm kind of like, I'm navigating the world of, I, I'm, I'm kind of stuck in the machine. Uh, I had a, like when Occupy happened, I had an eight month old, my first son at the time, who's now 10. And, 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 um, so my wife and I were like new parents and like, that's why we could just go down there every now and then. And, 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 you know, once at a certain point I was more organizing like things right in our neighborhood. Cause I couldn't get all the way into Manhattan living in, in Bushwick at the time. But, um, but I was like, Oh, you know, as an anarchist, I'm not part of like, um, a collective or this group. But over time I started to realize, um, that as a, as a philosophical mindset, I, I try to parent as an anarchist, you know, I, I have a relate or my relationship with my, my wife is, is very, you know, flat, you know, any, any authority someone has over a domain in the house is derived from expertise. Like, oh, you're the one that's very good at that. And, but, and I will, I will yield to your authority or there's things where, you know, we all discuss it. And with my kids specifically, um, them understanding like, why a rule exists and their fear of, you know, not doing the rule. It's like, well, then you're, we're going to have a long, you know, grueling talk about the consequences. Um, I may raise my voice, you know, I'm only human, but they've never lived under a threat of violence for compliance. And I, I regularly, you know, with certain things, they say like these rules, if you ever really disagree with like why we do a thing, um, we can talk about it. And so that's the beginning of where I just started to recognize, okay, um, maybe I didn't, I'm not doing this radical, obvious thing that anarchists do this or that, but on my day-to-day -day life, interpersonal relationships, I saw in a previous interview you had with a, a musician who was saying like, you know, asking sort of that question, what can, how can I be an anarchist or promote that? Well, certainly if you, I, you know, I do music too, and I'm, I've met a lot of musicians and I would think applying that non-hierarchical structure to the creative process as much as possible, inviting everyone to contribute to that, to see good faith criticism as a gift. Someone's telling you something that you can't see from your vantage point, you know, and there's bad faith criticism. Of course, it's meant to soothe egos and attack. And, but there, you know, science is based on, please criticize my thinking. Like you said, it's a natural uh, frame fr uh, mindset that would that would overlay perfectly into that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think um, one of the challenges of uh, having a discussion about how anarchism relates to interpersonal politics is is mostly just that I have this uh, 
uh, uh, reservation because some people will turn anarchism into a purely lifestyle politics where it's all about what they do with their personal life and how they dress and what music they listen to and, and what, you know, what sort of job do they do and, and, you know, and, and so on. Right. So sometimes I find myself being in the, in the position of pushing back against a, a sort of lifestyleist politics, but, of course, no successful conception of anarchism would be successful if it didn't have a conception of interpersonal politics, because, of course, it takes up number one, just takes up so much of our lives. Right. It's so much a part of what it is to be human is these politics of the interpersonal and what it's like to live with others and to make decisions together or in confrontation with others. And uh, so, yeah, I think, you know, the interpersonal aspect is super important and that any consistent anarchist, of course, has to be consistent in trying to reduce all of the hierarchical power relations that are that are present in their life. That is that is is part of being a good anarchist. Um, uh, like I said, I suppose what the only caveat I would offer is that it is not enough to be a no. good anarchist. Right. And I, I totally agree. And, um, you know, that's where I, I started. That's uh, I, I think with anarchy, I, it was sort of like a retroactive thing where I started to look at like, well, this is how I am. So that works with that's what led me to be like, oh, yeah, anarchism, because, um, you know, it's not that I, I won't engage with any electoral politics, but I realize it's like the the most you get out of it. Like if it's if, if anything, it's, it's not enough. You know, if you win, it's never enough. So there's you, you're always looking for something more. And then. I have started to just think of like how I have adopted um, doing journalism um, is essentially like, and I'm not looking to um, go into an established uh, organization uh, to an extent, because what I keep running into is journalists who have, you know, gone through like the formal training and gone the route of like, this is you work here and, and, and are inside these, hierarchical structures that are focused on commercialization above um, serving the, the, the role of, of, of even the best ones, you know, they got to worry about their bottom line, which means they're spread thin. But um, in going independent, seeing it as an opportunity for like dual power, something outside of the commercial system and, you know, very conscientiously going towards it. Like, yeah, I would, I would really like to figure out how to do the small, subscriber thing or if i have you know big donors who want to donate to me like honestly like anyone who wants to give me money i'm like i'm gonna look gift horses in the mouth <laughs> uh <laughs> i like that so, saying i'm gonna i'm gonna use that one i think yeah you know just but um you know that's how i've started and, and like i said very much wearing my anarchism on my sleeve as a way to say this is not a radical because that's one thing that has to happen with anarchism to an extent is to de-radicalize it and i can't tell you like the amount of conversations i've had now where as i've developed more of my shorthand and my understanding for things to have conversations with people who've never really realized it's more of it's a political philosophy not a shorthand for let's just break stuff nobody's in charge um i actually like said something to a woman i was at a high school reunion with like within a couple of minutes of talking with her, she's like, hey, you know, I might be an anarchist and, and reaching that, that level. And, and I haven't had that problem so far when I related to people. And more importantly, you know, when I get to more content, people are more contentious are usually ones that are probably more ideologically aligned and certainly radicalized. And you're aware of, you know, there's, if you're online, you see um, the, the, the Marxist, Leninist, communist beef, or whatever, you know, and, and I am aware of that. And I have communist friends who I feel like I'm their, I'm the good anarchist that they, they, they let into their circle of trust and they, they know I'm not whatever, but there's all these shorthands that demean anarchists as like anarchy anarcho kitties or whatever, and say it's, it's a juvenile posture. And my debates with them is usually like, you know, t while it is woo woo to say like anarchy is a mindset, man, but it's like, no, it is. It's the predicate to like, for me, like to be comfortable with a socialist, like the ultimate communism or some like economic system like that, we'd have to all be anarchists for that to work and have that, you know, that's what we need is like, you know, like, 
because I understand, you know, listening to you and talking about how it's not about finding this perfect system. It's about finding um, something that's constantly seeking feedback from those who are governed by any system. So the idea of uh, just a totally authoritarian government preceding, you know, people being free of that, I don't see how that works just because of how power dynamics are. And um, it's, it's just an interesting thing to find that, like, certainly, I think communists and anarchists, to an extent, have to agree, like, well, neither of us are as bad as your, your average capitalist or, you know, neo-feudalist to some degree with like what's going on in, 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 in the direction of, of our country. But then when we get to that point of like, you know, contention that you, you've articulated and gone into a lot, um, that your videos really like kind of hammer home, like here's why these are incongruous. Um, at the same time, I have, you know, I know that the people um, who are, call themselves communists that I, you know, know locally, well, they're doing things that do need to be done as far as like forming block clubs to get organize the citizens and, and find out what their issues are and bypass the electoral system, sort of a dual power thing. And it's the sort of thing where as if that is a starting point, that's good. As long as it never gets to a point where any of these neighbors who join this block club do not have a means for their voice to be heard and seriously considered if they're coming in good faith, then however they're communism, communisming right now is cool. Um, I have some solidarity with that. And they certainly, you know, being close to all radical activist circles in my profession, as much as, you know, more so than, and then having access to, you know, powerful people is where I've found there's a, I get close to a lot more stories that need attention. Yeah. I, I notice I notice in uh, a lot of what you're discussing here, the return to a, a uh, topic that I've talked about a lot. And that is this idea that we need to be out anarchists, like crypto anarchism is something you do in a workplace where you're afraid or is something you do when you're around it around an authority structure that could punish you for it. But when you're around people and you're talking to people outside of that authority structure or even inside of it, if you're, for example, unionizing or something, you should just say you're an anarchist. And um, there's this weird thing where the, often people will be like, how do you talk to people about anarchism without using the A word or whatever? And I'm like, well, step number one is to use the A word. Like, say you're an anarchist, defend anarchist philosophy and political ideology, explain anarchism, tell people you are an anarchist and then explain it. And I think that's extremely important. Um, the part of the part of the reason it is stigmatized is precisely because anarchists aren't calling themselves anarchists and defending that viewpoint in a public sense. Um, so that has to be directly pushed back against. Um, and it's I not think- to say too. I mean, and uh, I think in the 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 most recent interview you did, there was a part of it where you actually it was the the term was put out there that I I've said to other people, which is flavors of anarchism. There are many flavors of anarchism. And if I'm coming to someone that has, for whatever whatever reason, taken in something that biases them against anarchism, they think it's one thing. um, The first thing I I remind them is like, look, anarchism is an actual political philosophy and it has many flavors. Like, you know as much about me if I tell you I'm an anarchist as if I tell you I'm a Christian. You know, am I a Quaker? Am I a Catholic? Am I a Dominionist? Do I dance with snakes? You don't know Um, but if you don't know anything about, you know, Christianity and just like anything else, it's like, I think the mental posture that's really like kind of struck me as a a very useful thing. And I think is something that should be embraced as like any real anarchist endeavor is, um, curiosity, because what I see is, um, there's a lot of people and, and I, I include myself in this when I was younger, you're kind of looking for, um, you know, what's the answer? Do I become a Democrat? Do I become a Republican? Am I, should I be a libertarian? You know, what thing do I have? I need to lock into it and become certain about it. Um, and while I am certain that, um, anarchy is, is now a, a 
political philosophy with as far as like the thinkers behind it, the ways that is being attempted to be applied as just a guide star of, of, you know, political thinking. Um, it is going to be a process of constantly being curious about what's the best way to govern. And the problem with capitalism is, you know, they have tried to assert that we have reached the end of history. This is the answer, capitalism. And communists say like, no, 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 we got to go a little, little bit further. Then that's the end. <laughs> and no, there's no end. There will only be means to get a little right. zen. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. I I mean, it's funny you say to get a little zen, but there's actually a lot of that sort of zen uh insight within especially within the individualist anarchist tradition, but but also within the social anarchist tradition. Um and the, and the and the the worst part is is that the the communists who see communism as an end are being inconsistent with their own political philosophy, which indeed sees communism as just a you might say the beginning of history as per the way they see it through Hegel. So like, you know, it's you have this bizarre thing where if people actually just like read Marx and tried to understand Marx uh, in context of Hegel and all of that, they would probably have a much more libertarian socialist perspective. They'd be much closer to anarchists. Unfortunately, they don't read Marx. They read Lenin. They read Marx through Lenin. They read Marx through Stalin. They may read Marx through Mao. And that gives them a much more authoritarian um, sort of um, capitalism repackaged with red aesthetics is the result a lot of the time. And so you get a lot of those same mentalities, this, these same sort of end of history mentalities, the, the belief that they've, they can achieve some, you know, ideal super system or something that will just have everything figured out. There's no concept of feedback because it's just full of hubris, you know, full of this idea that you can, you can plan perfectly plan everything in society all at once. And, and um, yeah, I think that just fundamentally goes against the grain of, of the, the anarchist critique. Um, anarchists also seek communism most of the time if you look at the if you look at anarchist literature, but they don't seek a centrally planned authoritarian communism, uh, which is unfortunately all too common these days. Um, they instead seek a, a communism that functions from the dictate from each according to their ability to each according to their need. And basically just saying, well, how can we achieve that while well, having a society wherein we have freedom, equality, and solidarity with all people? And um, yeah, so that's essentially why, why I hold that, that perspective as opposed to a more authoritarian perspective. And the more I research, the more I feel that it is vindicated. Um, I think that in, in, in a significant way, kind of looping this back into that interpersonal politics, looping this back into, you know, claiming your anarchism and all of that. Um, I think that like doing, doing this discernment that we just discussed here for maybe the last three or four minutes ish or something is often very helpful for pe helping people understand where anarchism lies within the political milieu, you might say, right? Where it's like, you know, in this way, using these radical terms, being like, yes, I'm an anarchist. Yes, I'm a communist. No, I don't want a state. Yes, I want a society uh, of, of equality without the market. These things at first will be very confusing for people. But if you actually talk your way through them, it can often be extremely enlightening such that they understand not only where anarchism lies, but where it lies in contrast to what they don't want. Right. When they say, well, I don't want the USSR. I don't want, you know, modern China. I don't want and it. It helps reinforce this this idea. It's like, well, in fact, neither do I. I almost these are the examples of why I, you know, why I don't hold that ideology. Right. Um, this is off. The, all of these topics link together in a very helpful way when you're educating people about anarchism, I found. And I, it's. I don't know if it's a, a, a shallow way to put it, but it, it, it's certainly true in some sense that I also just, I'm never going to be comfortable calling myself some dude-ist, some <laughs> dude name um, yeah. it, it, You know, it's sort of reinforcing the great, the, you know, the great man trope, you know, it's because, you know, it's like, the, you know, one person writes this down, but it's like there, we can move on. There can be more than that. So I've always been a fan of like on a, 
guess on a taxonomy level, like just naming things. I like that anarchy is not a ta- I'm not a, you know, like you may say that your flavor is this or that, but ultimately like, you know, the way communists are always wearing like, well, I'm, I think like this person from a hundred years ago, I'm like, ah, you know, it's like, it, it's, it, it reinforces that idea. It's like they're that at a certain point, you know, they, they figured it out and we don't have to go, you know, we can just keep deriving things from that person's thinking seems like a, a, a stifling idea to me. Yeah, absolutely. And I find it very peculiar that they are so they they often have this tendency to call themselves scientific thinkers. And I just like ask them, where in science is there this great man worship? Like we don't call, you know, physicists don't call themselves Newtonians or Gaussians or Laplacians. Yeah, but put, I mean they there is there is actually one thing that like I think they finally stopped they're starting to stop doing, but I, I, when I did stand up for a minute, like 10, 12 years ago, I, I did a, a joke about Asperger's, which was about how it's a terrible fucking name for that disease, you know, for that condition, uh, for that. And now it's no longer, I think, even used, you know, it's someone who's autistic and in, you know, there's a specific like part of them on the neurodivergent spectrum. But yeah, that like they named, th- they named conditions after like science should be getting rid of that. And I like that they, they, there's that move towards that because it's just nonspecific. Yes, yes, absolutely. What you'll find is that generally when scientists use a name like that, it's either just like a placeholder, like in the example of Asperger syndrome, or it's kind of just like, oh, this guy discovered it or this guy named it. So it gets named after him. But, but you know, when they approach physics, they don't say like, I'm a Newtonian or I'm an Einsteinian or you, you know what I'm saying? Like there is only uh, one yeah. physics. There's only one physics. Physics isn't named Einsteinian physics, right? It's not named Gaussian uh, calculus. You know, it's like the name they're given names that, that, uh, appropriately refer to them as broad fields. And there are people who made advances within them whose names may be appro- like attached to techniques or formulas, but the field does not rely upon the, the, you know, the maintenance of the, the, you know, reputation of these great men. That's not what it's about. The ideas are what maintain themselves. And I think that's what I also see taking place in anarchism, where, you know, you may, you may, for example, be an anarchist very influenced by Malatesta. That would be normal. Um, you may be very influenced by Stirner, and that would be normal, or Bookchin, and so on and so on, right? You might respect those ideas, and you might respect certain things within them, but you would still recognize yourself as an anarchist in the same way as someone might recognize themselves as like a physicist. You would recognize those people made contributions. They gave us certain ideas and theoretical frameworks that we use and lenses that we use to understand things. So I see a lot more of the scientific mindset within anarchism than I do within these these, um, authoritarian structures, which seem to me, uh, not to get too polemic here, but they seem to me to be much more related to religion than they are to science. Wow. You just, you just read my mind because I was, I was thinking about how I did want to, I wanted to get into religion and, and how, um, how that overlays with, uh, anarchy and, and, um, I, that's one feel it's one aspect of anarchy. I'm not really aware of is like, um, how, um, religious thinkers have come to this because I would, I would think it would have to be ones who treat their religion with, the appropriate amount of, I guess, you know, more that, you know, it, it is spiritual metaphysical versus, uh, of religion is a manifestation of a hierarchical structure because I was raised in, um, as a Catholic and the rigidity of that and the stories that just get pushed onto you with, with, with mostly just, you know, out of recitation and repetition and, um, they just didn't stick. And by the time I got older and found a lot of, um, you know, more curiosity about the world and more like wonder at things, um, I found that it was just such a small language or the notion of a creator being anthropomorphic. It was very easy to shed that like, and, you know, and I, you know, luckily I never went through like a new atheist phase, so to speak, but I definitely like 
found my atheism and it when it hit pretty home. And um, I remember listening to a lecture by um, like some liberty, I think it's a uh, David Brin, who's more in the libertarian side of things, but he gave this fantastic lecture about uh, speak as like um, scientists trying to reach people who were very much into the Bible and, and pointing out to them that like the story where God tells Adam to name all the animals that's like a great metaphor for science and taxonomy and using their language to, you know, just say like, and that's where I started to think about science is like, yeah, that's, that's a celebration of creation, understanding everything. Like I, and I, I find that that's a far more like deep appreciation of for creation than, like I said, something that's anthropomorphized and filtered through uh, human made hierarchical structures and it very much does overlay with, with anarchic thinking and my, the, to button up to like one thing that really hit home atheism for me was actually, um, becoming a parent. And I was thinking about when, when my kid was still in my wife's belly and it just struck me one night, like how there's, there's no communicating with that being in there. Um, even if you put speakers in there or electrodes or a screen, they can't possibly communicate with what's beyond the threshold of their existence. And thinking about how time dilates and slows down, like if you had to sit in a dark room and hear nothing and see nothing for 10 minutes, that's a long time. And that they, they, so like, you know, that a human being, a human mind consciousness lives in this whole world and then dies and there's no way that the afterlife, which is our world, could communicate with that. It's got to be the same thing with whatever comes next. So anyone who tells you they know, we just can't, we, our brains can't know it any more than, you know, a child in the womb could know how to speak or a nine month old even, you know, you just have to develop and it's not something that be brought to you. Yeah. So, you know, you, you brought a lot to the table here for us to discuss, I suppose, you know, it's a big, it's a big subject on the, the interrelation of religion and, and anarchism and, and, uh, views of uh, the view of the universe and, and all of that. Um, I consider myself at minimum an atheist. Uh, I guess you'd say I'm an agnostic atheist, um, which is to say, I don't, I don't believe I hold knowledge of, of, of whether it is true or not. Um, I, I'm an anti-theist insofar as that I don't think religion is good, but I'm not a militant anti-theist, you might say. I'm not going around trying to also convince people of the same thing. Um, historically, you'll find that anarchism was pretty militantly anti-theist. Uh, if you read a lot of old anarchist texts, you're going to find them constantly inveighing against religion. Uh, more than just even anti-clericalism, uh, which is kind of a given in leftist politics, you know, being against the church. Uh, they were actually against religion, uh, against theism as a, as, a, as a way of thinking, uh, believing that it was a, a control mechanism to a significant degree. Um, I, I hold somewhat similar beliefs. I don't think it arose as a control mechanism. Um, well, it certainly th serves to, you know, if I said like a, a, a important guidepost for human development is curiosity and to a certain extent, something like Catholicism, in my view and experience, it serves as a, a stopping point of something to give you certainty in order to put your curiosity at bay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. To be fair, though, I think a lot of things function in that capacity. I yes. think there's a lot of things that function that way. Um, I think that certain religion and certain denominations are just explicitly arose as control mechanisms. That much is like uncontroversial. But some some anti-theists also try to argue that all religions sort of arose as a control mechanism. I don't know if I can agree to that thesis. But what I will say is in the modern era, what you'll see is um, one of the parts that anarchism has shed is the militant anti-theism. Uh, you'll see that there's still a significant atheist and anti-theist presence within the anarchist movement, but that there is a much more of a consciousness that there are religious and supernaturalist perspectives, you might say, which are fully compatible with the atheist political project. And that requiring people to be anti-theist or atheist at minimum or whatever to be an anarchist is, is too much. Uh, it, it seemed probably a lot more rational right after the Enlightenment 
you know, when like, like you could see the, the material ways in which the, you know, the, the clergy was interacting with power structures and was so clearly embedded within them and wherein it was just so toxic to society in every single way, in a way that it would have been impossible for almost anybody to deny. In the modern day, we see that these religions have exploded into thousands of denominations and different interpretive frameworks, um, many of which have been explicitly uh, uh, merged together with anarchism. You'll find plenty of like Muslim anarchism and Zen anarchism, you know, and more broadly, even Bud Buddhist anarchism or Hindu anarchism, Christian anarchism. Christian anarchism is one of the biggest ones, <laughs> you know? So it's like, you know, in the modern era, you see that there's a lot more uh, philosophical cooperation, you might say. And part of that is because of those religious people coming to anarchism and saying, hey, guys, uh, pretty much love everything you got here. Would just really like if you could make a little bit of room for us, you know, and I suppose anarchists of maybe the last 70, 60, 70 years, if I'm just kind of guessing, guesstimating, have been way more open to that kind of like hearing those arguments and, and recognizing that there will need to be a philosophical pluralism in the anarchist movement. And I can't see that it would be difficult for, you know, in, you know, imagining, you know, a just like, you know, a, a clump thousand level like idea of an anarchist society where, you know, these people are religious and to whatever degree there's hierarchy and how they practice their religion, as long as it's not imposing upon the community at large, um, you know, there's, there's, they, you know, if they elevate certain people to positions of power, but, you know, beyond that enclave, hopefully if they're all anarchists, they're having a healthy questioning of whoever they're granting authority within their, their, their independent structure, because, you know, that's, I think the thing where people get, it gets hard for me or anyone to start imagining like, well, where does this go from what's the, uh, we're doing it. We're living, but we're living the means and we have reprioritized so many things to, um, I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, talking to some degree about the notion of, you know, a difference in, in anarchic thinking is that maybe a goal should be for all of us to work less. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's bizarre how that's been. Well, you know the weirdest thing about the about the the anti work discourse is that um, that was uncontroversial on the left writ large in the the wave of uh, revolutions in the late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds, all the way really until the USSR came into significant power, um, anti-work was considered sort of the baseline understanding of the left. We're trying to reduce work almost out of existence, turning it to its base, base most necessity. Um, part of the reason why that planning was so favored over, you know, markets or other mechanisms was because in their mind, if we planned things really well, people would have to work way less. There'd be way less wastage. There'd be way less, you know, overproduction crises. And that's why they focused so much on overproduction crises being like, look how much they overproduce. Look how much unnecessary labor there is. Look how much of, of labor is actually just done to profit the capital. Capitalist. All a lot of those arguments were specifically to justify why we didn't need to work nearly as much, why we could work at minimum half as much, and often they would uh, predict much, much less than that. Weirdly, I don't, and this is just bizarre to me, but in the modern era, that is an actual contentious topic on the left where you have all these people actually trying to defend <laughs> that we need to work all the time. And that like, you know, no matter what society you're in, you know, it's like, it, it really betrays to me, like, you know, this, cause one thing, um, anarchism as, as how I, I tend to look at it is that it requires faith in people, obviously, you know, it does require a faith that, that people, if given the opportunity, if given the mechanisms to, rule and, and share power versus be ruled, um, that they would, they would do better. And, and also believing with this regard, like, yeah, if we weren't making sure everyone was working as much as possible, it's like that everyone had leisure time, trusting that it's not, you know, this would be a realignment of thinking and priorities and values, like 
create art, be with people, um, you know, f- do communal activities that just bring you joy, you know, um, with your time. So what if it's not always producing towards, you know, because f- the ultimate thing that like, I feel like anarchy has to uproot on in a sense, you know, if we're talking about a hierarchical power structure that um, is certainly abstract, it would be, you know, the paradigm of money and the profit motive which dominates everything right now that we, we need to have people who are greedy. We, that's a thing we need to have. It's the only way everyone will work. Like that's kind of the ultimate logic of this whole thing. Um, yeah. I mean, so this, this sort of gets into all the, like get, uh, the terrain of like imagining what, you know, what we would want to see, um, in in a, ultimately like a, a society where anarchism reaches the tipping point as, as a political, alignment that people adopt and yeah. then start exercising it that way and move beyond the left right thinking. Yeah, I think I think that um you know poking at this this topic about work and trying to bring in this ethic of a society where we govern ourselves, where we determine the amount that we work, where we have control over our future is probably one of the broadest appeals of leftist thinking and is what led to, in my opinion, a lot of these revolutionary waves of history insofar as that there is always an intermixture of the ideas of people changing and the material, the material structures of society failing and things like that. But like, this is what made it so appealing to such a broad array of people was this desire to take back control of their life, this desire to eliminate the constant work and, 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 and toil that, that, that defined their every day. Um, and, and I think we should be trying to bring back some aspect of that. I mean, you can see how successful the anti-work subreddit I mean, by successful, I mean, it expanded, it had, it made a big megaphone. That's what I mean to say. Mm. You know, you can see how fast the meme spread, how quickly this was just second nature that people would recognize they don't want to work, right? Like that's the easy part of our rhetoric. And yet some, some amount of it has been abandoned because of the authoritarian impulses, which have entered into the movement, which still want to convince us that, that, it, you know, this extreme, uh, labor, uh, is, is the, the only thing that makes society function at all. So what we need to be doing is reclaiming this, this conception, you know, the people should govern themselves. The people should determine for themselves what the extent of their labor needs to be together. They need to make these decisions. Um, getting back inter- sorry, that it's funny. This one just came to mind, but going back a few steps, you know, you discussed, uh, the, the religious group off, uh, you know, a- imposing their own hierarchies and all of that. Um, I would agree broadly with your, with your characterization insofar as that any community can delegate anyone they like as per in an anarchist process. Um, I suppose the only limitation I could see in that would be, um, uh, if they had acted outside of that process in order to put somebody in place of tyrannical power, that would probably still be unacceptable in an anarchist society at minimum, perhaps yeah. they would be disassociated from. Uh, that's, but once a, again, and that's another subject too, with uh, the means and the, the means intertwined with the end. And another thing that um, in my reading of uh, anarchism that jumped out once I got closer into the theory was uh, having identified the difference between representation and delegation like Mm -hmm. we think you are someone that's gonna you know vote the way we we like we hope so Mm -hmm. you have the power hope sure hope that you you say who you are you know that's the that's the bet we keep doing so sure hope you can do what you said you do and versus no we voted and these are the things you got to go to washington and ask for yeah, yeah. Or or you might even say it's like we voted and this is the process that's going to be carried out. We just need a dude to oversee these three things. Can you oversee these three things? And he goes, yeah. And they go, cool, you're delegated. And as soon as he stops overseeing those three things or they just don't like the way he's doing it or they decide to change the entire rule structure and not need delegates, the guy's not a delegate anymore. So it's just, it's a, it's a radically different process. It's essentially like a, from the ground up generative process where everything that is built is built by the people. It's like the, uh, the Lego approach, you might say, 
you know, like instead of like somebody giving you a dollhouse, you know, you build the dollhouse and then you determine who stays in the dollhouse and so on and so on and so on. Everything is customizable, I guess, is another way to say it. Um, yeah. yeah. One thing you've like mentioned that. numerous times, which is super important, but I've kind of like not not really responded to is is means ends unity. And, um, you know, even though I, I would uh, be happy to take responsibility for for emphasizing this this aspect of means ends unity, um, I would just like to emphasize that it's one of the most important parts of anarchist theory. I think it really goes back to the roots of anarchism. And a big part of the reason why is because a lot of modern anarchist thought has arisen, arose precisely because it was um, in in a contraposition to people who were asking to use authoritarian uh, means. So a lot of what the what the anarchists were tasked with doing was pointing out, no, you can't use that and you can't use that authoritarian mean, you can't use that authoritarian mean, you can't use that authoritarian mean, and when they had to ask themselves why it was that all of these things were the case. It was clearly because these means precluded the ability to achieve our ends, right? Like this was just continually the argument they had to return to over and over and over where it's like, yeah, I know guys, it seems like it'd be real convenient, but like we won't get anything done. If you do that, that's just shooting us in the foot. You know, it seems really great right now, but it basically means we'll never be able to run the long run. You know, like that's essentially the argument the anarchists have been tasked with making now for like 150, 160 years, something like that, you know? Um, so yeah, means ends unity is in incredibly important. And um, I, I think it appropriately sort of links together everything we've discussed so far, you know? Yeah. And it would get to, you know, establishing... Um trust in in whatever um we need to whatever structures need to be create because created because right now like everything's broken down and, and it's it's fascinating to think of like if <clears throat> we're reimagining things like the justice system um and, and certainly uh the process of of voting and the fact that like you know um you know, and to what degree can, can corporations, can corporate power exist? Um, because there was one thing that, you know, started to strike me as I was moving along in, in, in um, the, you know, moving along in corporate America and like advertising before I really, my political consciousness and class consciousness had developed. Uh, I was just like recognizing slowly, oh, there's no, um, <clears throat> there's no democracy in my workplace. The owner of these places just says we're doing this or you know whatever and and that's that's what happened and seeing that these were all mini dictatorships and maybe the bigger they got there was you know some there's a board and and stockholder but it's like the cogs in the machine none of you had any say in like you know this is what we're doing when we we we're going to acquire this company or not that was all you know not even represented by any of it just dictated and that's why I say, like, I feel like we're living under with, with the way corporate power is in terms of how people's lives are. It's like this neo-feudalism, considering how many, like, personal relationships exist between those who have power in the corporate world and even in the, then the overlap in the political world. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, it, and it's funny, insofar as we're talking about the corporate world as a, as a, a mean that cannot achieve our ends, um, you know, part of me wonders if that was, uh, or, or I've, I've, uh, often wondered out loud if that was the big mistake of the hippie movement. Um, you know, you had a lot of people in the hippie movement where they kind of really hyper-focused on these interpersonal politics, thinking that their conception of the world, their, their treatment of individuals was everything. And that if just you got the right people into the positions of power, if you only got the right guys sitting at the table, if the CEOs were just the right sort of people who read enough, you know, Buddhism, uh, it would be it would be good. You'd have Buddhist CEO, you know, the Buddhist CEO would make it a Buddhist corporation and, you know, and so on. And, and this really became more broadly the failure we now recognize as sort of like liberal identity politics, not identity politics itself, but liberal identity politics, right? This sort of idea where it's like, well, what we really need is more trans drone pilots, you know, <laughs> like, and, and it, 
it just, yeah, I mean, it reproduces the same problem over again. Um, I think that, that you th- fundamentally, the corporation cannot be anything other than it is. A hierarchical power structure cannot function as anything other than it is. Am I, did you ever see the documentary, um, the, the corporation where they yeah. basically apply the oh, yeah. DSM four to it as, and, and conclude that it's a psychopathic you know, entity. But, um, I, as I recall in that, it was fascinating when they talked about the original utility of a corporate entity was like, we need to get a bridge built. So we're forming this corporation that says, we're building the bridge. If it crashes, the corporate corporation, the political entity on paper is liable, who gets sued, whatever money we put in the coffers to build the bridge, whatever, to protect them. But then the bridge was built, corporation gone. So they were supposed to be like finite. So it's like, so I can see some sort of utility in that if people are, you know, form, but what they have become is means to, yeah, um, just the, like when they changed it from, the goal of this corporation is to build bridges to this bridge to this goal of this corporation is to make all the money. Period. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Because you know what they, what we had before then were of course businesses. Lot, there were lots and lots of businesses, but the corporation as an entity uh, came about and like I watched the same documentary as you. So I'm, I'm pulling from the same knowledge base, but you know, essentially uh, 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 it was publicly commissioned right? It was publicly commissioned in order to carry out some task, was meant to essentially dissolve after that task. But the question is, is like what happens when the task is ongoing, right? I think that's essentially what we saw play out. Um, and, and, you know, that, that's a possible failure mode to pay attention to in any system. Uh, but, but yeah, uh, the, I, I broadly agree with the, the outcomes of that movie, um, you know, or at least in diagnosing that the behaviors we associate with antisocial personality disorder uh, are all very, very present within the corporation. But it's, you know, it, the corporation is just one of many examples. And I guess one, that's one of the things I've tried to demonstrate, like, in a theoretical sense, time and time again, with every work that I've created is that it's like, it's not just the corporation. The corporation is one of many manifestations of this, of hierarchical power and everywhere hierarchical power functions, it reproduces the same sort of antisocial um, behavior. And this is where I definitely would recommend your, uh, your series on um, the state is counter revolutionary, I believe <laughs> it's called. And um, yeah, really just understanding the state is that mechanism which some people it's not questioned that we have that or certainly it's um it's not considered that you know as 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 um problematic as it is on a fundamental level for what its intended purpose is you know the management of chaos um and 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 so forth and and i certainly have have wondered what would what would um we got rid of the state, but then we still, what functions do we still need to get done? Are they, and they're just carried out with, um, you know, however that group of people that it affects want to carry it out. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, this is where it's funny because I wish that conversations came this far. A lot of the time when I was talking with people in the authoritarian left, because this is where the interesting questions come in, which is like, you know, where are the failure modes of even an anarchist system, right? Okay, like imagine the anarchist system needed to do X, Y, Z. Um, how would it carry it out? And if we really understood what the checks and balances of that system were, how could it still go wrong? Because I'm very interested in those questions. Like I seek to answer those questions and figure out good answers to those questions. Um, but I find that I never even get the chance to talk about these things. Um, I think one of the possible failure points in an anarchist system is very appropriately, given what we just discussed, um, permanent delegation. When when it's like you're delegating someone to a task and that task is pretty much a permanent thing that needs to happen, right? There's always going to need to be somebody who does that task. And you are continually in a position where you're delegating someone and it's like, you don't really get to decide. I mean, you get to decide as per the system, but ultimately you will always have to have some guy in X position doing X task. And so that ends up being extremely replicative of the representative system. 
right? Yeah. Where, oh, I have to choose a guy for X task. I don't get to choose about any of that. He just does X task and I'm just choosing every year who gets to do that task. The only difference is, and this is the upside to an anarchist system, is if they were displeased with that process, if they were displeased with that permanent position of delegation, they could just abolish the entire delegated position outright. You know, they could just say it doesn't even exist anymore. Now it's actually handled by six people who right. are on constant rotation and we vote them or, you know, here's a big list, rotate through the list. You know, like it's, it's at least possible solutions would be at hand. Right. Yeah. Like, uh, I, but, I love the idea of, of just playing like, like, Hey, we, you know, why did, again, like, why did we stop thinking of ideas once we came up with voting, you know? And also that took us so long to get it just the basics of voting, right? Like everybody ha gets to, um, but then going further than that, like, you know, um, I, I, over the years, it started out as a joke, but it's never left my mind as like, how can it be worse? Um, once I said like, what if you extended like the mechanism of jury duty to the Senate? So you're a registered voter. And at some point you get a letter and says, you're going to be Senator for six months. You have one year to learn. And then like, what if we made really stringent requirements on elected representatives say we were going to have representative but we start chipping away at it and like we in in ohio where i live from now on if you want to be senator like you have to be, spend like six months attending these these count city hall you know like going around and listening to people and then the previous person ha can onboard you but that's all a very transparent process but yeah it's just randomly chosen versus like it's always the moneyed class. And more than that, you know, the thing that troubles me getting, you know, looking at politics at closer than ever and being a hyper local evangelist too. Like, I don't care if you are not an anarchist, you're a Democrat, you're a liberal, you're, um, you're a communist. Like if your efforts local, you're getting more ROI and people need that attention. But, um, <clears throat> I forget where I was going with this, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, I mean, you know, that's 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 like I guess you're absolutely right that that system would probably function better in some ways. It would function worse in other ways, obviously, but it would function better in many ways. It would probably represent the needs of the people quite a bit more. It would probably be quite a bit more chaotic. <laughs> Things would be a lot more uh, r ridiculous. You'd probably have entire Congresses or entire Senates where it would just be hilarious tomfoolery for you know however long they were in the in the position. But it would probably be better than the not hilarious tomfoolery which oh, our system currently does. <laughs> I wanted to say this. I wanted to say this. That's where that's where I, I trailed off with. Uh, I, broke my, I broke my own brain for a second was, um, the way that looking at the current political system in America functions, like the kind of person you have to be and who will succeed if they're willing to, you know, compromise their morals and in, in all the right ways, it's really become like this niche for, you know, toxic narcissists and like people who are just like, they love the attention. They'll do anything for the attention. Um, and, and all these compromised people and, and, and favors owed and, and the machine of it all. It's just, um, the, and the fact that, you know, the only people who, a lot of the people who aspire to like rise to certain levels, they're like, oh, I've wanted to be a politician since I was a kid. I won't name mm -hmm. names, but there's specific people I think of who it's like, and when I hear that in interviews, it kind of chills me to the bone because then if they adapt that mentality early enough and they're just like, well, this is how the system is. I'm going to figure out how to, I'm going to be the best at navigating this system. And the system is monstrous though. It just keeps producing monsters who will, you know, be obsequious to whoever will allow them to rise in it so they can fulfill their dream. They've always wanted to be president. Those people scare the hell out of me now. The more like I'm oriented towards thinking of like the kind of person that wants the power that you and I find disturbing and corrupting. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's there's you know, it's it's funny because for years I would I was like wrestling. Or I guess I'll start it a different way. You know, there's always this saying that, you know, um, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. 
but I remember being aware very young that like there were competing conceptions of what was happening with that, you know, that like power tracks the corrupted. That's another conception of it. Um, another conception is that power just reveals like power just shows what the people really are. Mm. Um, at this point, I've just realized those really aren't in competition. It's all those things, right? It's like power tracks the corrupted power corrupts the uncorrupted and it reveals a lot what was already within those people in almost every circumstance, a lot of both their weaknesses and less often their strengths. Right. Sure. Um, and so it's really all those things, you know, um, and that's kind of the worst part about it because you'll notice at the end of each of those analyses is corruption, right? <laughs> like <laughs> you both, you get a bunch of people in the seats of power who are corrupt because corruption is what made them want to go there to begin with. They're power seekers. Okay. So you get a lot of them off the bat who got there because they were power seekers. The ones who weren't power seekers, who are just there because they want to do good things will be corrupted by the system. Okay. Well now that's pretty much just both categories of people, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you just pretty much just covered all your bases. Everybody is corrupt at, the, at that point. And it really gives truth to the easy popular conception that everyone has and is said all the time by every person living under a republic and that is that their government is corrupt everybody knows it that all politicians are corrupt and that all politicians are liars and it's not because in many ways they are like bad people it's because even if they were good people it wouldn't matter it wouldn't matter the system needs what it needs. They are components, and as components, they must fulfill a particular purpose. Yeah, and that it, it becomes also, you know, again, feeding into like the there's like the the neo feudalistic aspect, especially really here on the local level, where you keep seeing the same family winning the same office over and over again. Uh, judge judgeships, all these other things that people don't aren't aren't paying attention to, and um, power is certainly not being dispersed. And if anything, it just keeps getting rolled over in the same narrow lane of of families and and connections. Um, but always in the you know, like it's always the thing that can win is like what is serving capital, what is serving money, not what is serving people and, you know, pumping the brakes to figure out the best type of government has just never been on the table. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot of things to could talk to you about. Um, if there's one that's left on the list, um, it certainly would like, I've always been really interested in seeing, um, an open source, a radical open source model for government. And this would certainly go towards like, the software that's ever used for anything. I think there's a lot of mistrust right now. It's like a lot of our election software, it's black box. It's um, run by private companies. It's been kind of terrifying, you know, talking again about like watching the liberals uh, do things that I'm like, what are you, what you now you're mad about that. That's <laughs> is like how, they're really like become eye rolling about the idea that elections can be stolen because Donald Trump is calling it out. It's like, that was one of the first things that animated me in politics was when I really realized how bad it was with how they purge voter databases and then who builds the machines and counts with them. And, and so, yeah, that's been another like instance where now the liberals all think if you're talking about these black box voting companies uh, now, now if that's the dominion of, crazy right wingers and and that's making my head spin <laughs> yeah yeah that one was one where i thought both both sides of the aisle were skeptical when i was young i feel like everybody was skeptical to the degree where i don't even remember what the name of the movie was but there was a big movie where the election get, it's like you know, the guy's not supposed to get into power and there's like ends up being like a conspiracy to prevent him. It's like kind of like a dark comedy. I don't remember what it was called, but essentially, you know, the the people who own the voting machines prevent him from getting into into power is essentially what happens in the movie. And, you know, I remember finding that just to be like, 
relatively uncontroversial as a premise for the movie. And I think that in a general sense, when I've told people about how the voting machines work, there's never been any pushback until, like you say, in the, in the modern era, where because the right wing utilized that talking point about a stolen election and all of that, now liberals are in denial about the possibility that elections have any lack of integrity you know, like that there is that there is anything to for us to be worried about. And it, it's it just really I mean, it, if anything, it's just caused by political expediency, um, them really not caring about what the truth of the matter is. It's all about securing their position of power within governance, you know. Um, but back to your previous comment about creating the sort of open source software for governance, um, you know, Insofar as that we are trying to use software in order to build a liberatory alternative, um, there is there are some efforts that are that are currently underway. Um, one I would bring attention to specifically is um, Black socialists uh, in America are developing something called the Dual Power App, and the Dual Power App is this attempt to essentially create um, an open source software that, um, automates flat democratic governance. Um, that it's, it's essentially like, um, if anybody's interested, I would go look it up the dual power app with BSA, uh, BSA, not DSA, but, um, uh, it's, it's, it's borrowing heavily from model, a model called sociocracy, which might also interest people to go, to go learn about. Um, but for for people that are like you and me that were in the Occupy milieu, uh, it, it's good, it borrows heavily from from consensus processes in Occupy, um, which of course were themselves borrowing from movements elsewhere in the world. So you know, I think uh, it's it's funny because I think you're like the third podcast or po- for third interview that I've I've been on where somebody has mentioned this this strong interplay of software, democracy, building alternatives. You know, it seems it seems very clear that there's something there. Well, I I think I wasn't even thinking of specific software as even just as like it's a it's a mandate, it's an ethos. Mm. Um, you know that that the kernel of the thing that is working on, there's no backdoors, ah, and and understanding that open source software is far more resilient, and there's a lot more confidence because all of the holes can be hit on by you know this person or that. Um, but yeah, the mechanisms in general, just making them, you know, radically transparent, uh, open and less gatekeeping. Um, I wonder to what degree, you know, in an anarchist world, you know, um, would we be abolishing surveillance powers as far as, you know, having cameras everywhere or, and this is like a pet fun idea is like, you know, what if we actually had the ability, okay, we have the NSA right now and there's strong suspicions that, this public official is, you know, whatever. We have Donald Trump, right? They're saying all these things that went on between Russia. Okay, time for the NSA to just give the public a report on that, you know? like, it, And that was something that I remember, you know, I was exposed to early on. Um, there's a book called, by that same libertarian um, thinker that I was reading, uh, David Brin. He has a book called The Transparent Society, and the thesis of that kind of, well, it was certainly prescient. It was just like saying, look, the cameras are coming. They are going to be in everything, everywhere and tiny. Um, and the only thing we can do is like watch the watchers. And so in a, and you know, in a, in an anarchist society, it's like, if we're, you know, either scaling back the ubiquity of technology and it's like, do we need a camera in every damn thing? Or is that something that gets adopted and rolled into like, well, now that level of surveillance and, and uh, power is in the hands of anyone who needs it, but it's radically logged. Whoever looks at anything and it has to be, yeah, I don't know, but these are all the kind of crazy things. that's interesting to think about if we were transforming oh, yeah. what we have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, I think, I think the short answer to the question is, you know, it'll be up to the people. Right. Like the nice part, (laughs) you know, like I said, it's back to this, this, this Lego mentality of building a governance, right. Where you're building it from the ground up. Um, and if the, and if the question is, you know, do we need intelligence to do X, Y, Z? Well, they can simply vote 
for that process to take place. And, you know, what I would imagine if I'm just like hypothesizing wildly about a the, a, the hypothetical world, it would be that there'd be some places where there would be a lot more extensive surveillance than others. Some places would have none because they don't think it's necessary and they vote did never vote to, to enact it. Some places that feel as if they are unsafe for one reason or another may have much more surveillance. Um, it may be that upon a, a confederation wide basis, they want intense surveillance of people who've been delegated, for example. You may want to have constant surveillance of delegates. That would be reasonable. You might actually just get- but not control. But the thing that would have to be abolished is the idea of a central, Correct. singular yeah. authority like the NSA, the CIA, or whoever. Right. And you know, th- actually, this is the last like big thing I did want to hit on because we, you know, um, and if there's anything else, you, I, I wanted to give you like you know at some point to talk about your ideas or things for anyone. Um, as far as like more on praxis, becoming an anarchist, moving these things forward beyond what we spoke about. But um, one thing I think really needs to happen to a degree is, and it's not to sound woo woo, but it is a raising of consciousness. You know, it's like it, it just as, as an American, and this is true, I think, you know, for anyone who's living under power structures, you know, like that have been protecting themselves and, and the victors in history is to what degree an anarchist society needs to like, we live, you know, we live in the truth. You know, if we, you know, we don't have the CIA and the NSA more and we understand the full true story of America um, and the true story of what rulers have done as a means to making sure we actually, you know, live up to the trope of like history will just repeat itself. And why does it keep repeating itself as living under abusive authoritarian and, and um, self-serving hierarchical structures is because we don't know the full history of how we have been continually abused by them. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's certainly something I was saying in that, that the last video that you mentioned in a modern anarchism, the first part there, um, you know, we've, we've essentially been beaten down by a structure of abuse. Um, we've come to blame ourselves like an abuse victim, you know? Um, and part of, part of our work is then, uh, uh, recognizing that it is not our fault. You might say that it's not that we, um, uh, have to free ourselves from our abuser in that sense. Uh, and I would say insofar as that, you know, I was, I was very influenced by decolonial thought when I was, when I was specifically reading about that topic and writing about it. But I would also say for, for people that are trying to do that for, for people that would like to begin that process of freeing their minds from, uh, a historical colonial process wherein humanity has been made to accept its own abuse. Reading Dawn of Everything by Graeber and Wingrow is probably an excellent idea. I think it would be very good for deprogramming people if anybody is interested in, in doing that for themselves. Um, obviously, however, I would like to once again emphasize decolonial literature was very influential for me on the same topic. So, um, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think obviously consciousness raising is part of the process. No movement exists if the people believe that nothing can be different. And yeah, my hope with um, as far as, you know, advancing the goal towards, you know, seeing us live by the means of, of an anarchist philosophy is um, certainly to have someone like you on introduce um, you to whatever audience I have. Um, and to wear it on my sleeve and say, you know, I'm here, I'm an anarchist. It's a, it's a very proud tradition and um, certainly maligned and de- and used constantly as, as a scapegoat. And there's a lot of stories of tragedy behind it um, as, as, you know, in the, in the radical tradition. And, and that was some of the first stories I heard about it. And then the more I found these reasonable people thinking about the real deep fundamental problems, the more I've been drawn to anarchy and uh, I really appreciate all the work you do. And if there's any, um, you know, anything you specifically would hope people uh, taking an anarchy would do uh, from this point forward. um, If, if they're on the fence, I'll give you the last word on, on advice for anarchists and where everyone can find you and the best ways to support your work. Cool. I, I would love to talk about this. So 
First, I just want to say for anybody is that's curious about anarchism as a political ideology, and you're not sure what you think, um, you can go subscribe to my channel. I'll talk about that here in a minute. My channel is Anarch, A-N-A-R-K. But honestly, there's a lot of really great materials that have been made on the subject. I would suggest Malatesta's An Anarchist Program. Uh, I would suggest Lorenzo Camboa Irvin's Anarchism and the Black Revolution, uh, which is one of the most important books in black anarchism that was ever written. Um, I would recommend Malatesta's Anarchy, Malatesta's At the Cafe. Uh, any of these would be great books to get yourself uh, situated within, within, the, within anarchist thought. Uh, and what I would suggest more than that, if you're somebody who's already um, sort of leaning anarchist and you're trying to ask yourself, you know, what's next? Um, obviously, I would tell you reading theory is good. Um, you know, the, uh, this whole thing, the interview began with me noting that I've been highly radicalized by reading theory myself. And I think many other people, it's the same thing that happens. But I would say, really ask yourself what could be done in the world. Um, you know, reading theory is only useful insofar as that it informs practice. Ask yourself if there are other anarchists around you and if a group can be formed that might actually do something to change people's lives. Ask yourself if organizations can be built which can construct dual power, which will be held by the people, which will not be, you, you won't go about begging for help from state structures or, or, or just trying to do entryism in other established groups to begin building something actually radical and revolutionary, something that is actually representative of anarchist values. I think that is extremely important. And if, if you are, if that, if that describes you, if you are somebody who are already leaning anarchist, um, I would really implore you to ask yourself how you can act in the world and whatever capacity is available to you. Ask how you can act in the world. Um, and then I, I suppose with all that being said, um, I run a YouTube channel called Anarch. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I try to actually write theory. Um, my conception of this channel from the get-go is that I am not writing to be at the mouth of the pipeline to anarchism. I am writing to be the end of the pipeline. <laughs> I am here for the people that want to do a deep dive, that are not going to be afraid of a detail and jargon and, you know, long analyses of phrases and historical events. You know, the people that are really finally there to figure out all of those, of those little ins and outs. That's what I've created this channel for, because I found that there was really so little resources available on YouTube at that level. And um, more than that, I've endeavored to try to make them as beautiful as I can. Um, even though I've, I do, I do, I have, I try not to compromise at all on the material itself. I am happy to make them visually beautiful and for them to have beautiful music over them and to oh, try I to put. Cannot recommend enough the the script uh, which you make available in a Google Doc, which is excellent for you know just being able to take things in and really go jump to you know what was that thing that was said that quote and mm -hmm. the imagery and the music was is gorgeous. I can't I can't tell you the, the, how how amazing the production level of of what you put out there. It's it's a, it's that kind of thing where it's you know I'm a I love the YouTube community for, for when people, you know, put the kind of work into it just because I, I you know, for whatever reason has motivated them. And, and, and I applaud you for your efforts. And I, I certainly immediately saw it and celebrated it and was um, looking forward to sharing it with everybody. And, and that's what having you on here was, I, I've actually realized through talking with you, it's like we have, um, I follow them on Twitter and I'm, wouldn't be surprised if I do know some of them. Like we have two local anarchist groups, the Burning River Anarchists and Forest City, um, that you know they participate in food, not bombs, and things like that. But I'm I'm so wrapped up in you know, and if I have my last word to just say, you double down on what you're saying, like form local groups, find people, and and I think where you find them is um, where I I hope mo most people will spend their their political energy, if they, they spend a lot of time online and thinking they need to take in this person's takes, or they're like, what do I, okay, what do I do with all of this angst? And, 
you know, yelling about what this, this political, like, you know, top level person saying or that, or what Joe Rogan said and all that, that kind of attention isn't going to get you as much as if you go into your local community and, and find people, if you're watching things online, you're into the YouTube creator community. There are people, and I, this is, I speak as a journalist, you got, you know, I work with sources and, and activists who are like older school, you know, like, like boomers and, and your, your hippie generation. And they're just, they're doing great work, but they don't know how to amplify it. They don't know how to put it out there. So it's like, um, connecting with them. And then I build credibility for anarchists as a whole as being like, well, the one person who showed up and listened to me and took me seriously is helping me is an anarchist. So if that's, you know, I think I, I would hope I'm doing that sort of practice, at least of like, I, that's the way I see it is I'm helping people because of my anarchist principles feel that the institutions of government are failing, certainly with what I cover in criminal justice and police abuse, an example of severe failures and people who are absolutely powerless over a system that can destroy them and um, going out there and not trying to say, hey, I can fix it. Like, how can I help? I love that approach. And in fact, I think it was, it's been really one of my big takeaways. If you're asking yourself how you can help people that are already in oppressed situations, th often the answer is as simple as show up for their struggles and continue to show up for their struggles. Don't ask for credit. Don't try to convert them. Show them that you actually care. Like it just, it sounds so simple as to be trite, yet it's true. And what you'll find in a lot of people that are in oppressed communities is they're just so tired of people entering, only caring about their struggles for a little while, looking for recognition and praise, trying to convert people or get them to come into their group. And it's like, all I can say is just do the opposite of that show up and actually care okay like recognize that your struggle is tied up in the struggle of everyone else that's that's the key well thanks so much for sticking around to the end i hope everyone will go and check out anarch's youtube channel uh specifically a modern anarchism the video that prompted this interview uh if i have one regret for this interview it's honestly the fact that uh, I hit stop on the recorder and then we just talked for like another hour, hour and a half. Um, and there was a lot of great stuff that came out of that conversation and kind of wish I'd been able to put it, some of it back into this. But uh, I think that uh, Anarch and I will be keeping in touch and hopefully uh, putting out some more content in the future. And I want to also, of course, take this time to thank all of my amazing Patreon supporters and uh, Substack subscribers. Uh, it's, there's, there's never any like good words for like thanking people through this medium. Like I, I hope to uh, see or talk to every one of you at some point soon and, and really give you an earnest handshake and look in the eye and say, thank you. I really, really like doing this work. And I know the people whose stories I'm trying to tell are really appreciative that someone's paying attention to them even if it's just a guy with a few hundred subscribers and, and, and a modest YouTube channel. But I'm, I'm hoping to grow the audience. Uh, I'm hoping to grow uh, support all towards, you know, doing this work full time, which unfortunately I'm not able to do right now. But I, I really look forward to having that opportunity and hopefully bringing other people along. Um, as you saw in this interview, I'm a big preacher of the gospel of local. And yeah, that's because it's my beat, but it's also because I just keep finding um, people at that level that are completely ignored who have real stories and show where the systemic failures that anarchists like myself are really concerned about, that's, that's where the rubber hits the road. And that's where you can find people who will be appreciative of your efforts and a lot more open to uh, hearing about your radicalism because hey, it's the radical that showed up and is actually helping me. And that's the kind of work that I think anyone who's concerned about big, deep changes like this discussion was, uh, that's where you should be putting your attention. So thank you for your attention, and I hope you have a wonderful whatever time of day or day of week it is. Have a, have a good one of those. <laughs>